good people to exit so we make sure we have clear communication. Can everyone hear me and see me okay? Beautiful. Okay, so um, first and foremost, I would really like to thank Vera um, and all of the folks who are working with Vera for organizing this historic panel. Um, it's critical at this point in, in history and time that we um, have a real discussion about the hard issues uh, related to racial and disability justice. So I want to thank you all for hosting um, this panel. Um, I second want to, uh, I, I wish uh, Senator Harkin had stayed. I wanted to let him know that he's social media famous with his like ever, ever going on and on and on viral video of him signing about the ADA back in the 90s on the floor. Um, and so we're still sharing that with hashtag ADA, hashtag all sorts of hashtags on Twitter. So um, really, really thankful for his leadership in this area. Um, I begin every discussion that I give, that I present, by centering the space. And that means uplifting the names of people who are no longer with us, making sure that we all recognize that we're not talking about numbers, we're not talking about um, statistics, but what we are talking about are human lives. Um, so I will begin today like I begin every other day, notwithstanding the building upon which we all sit or stand. Uh, Tanisha Anderson, Freddie Gray, Anthony Hill, Ezell Ford. These are African American people with disabilities whose lives were cut short by law enforcement. News media and advocates alike erase parts of their, disability, parts of their identities. Um, they often mention that they are black people who have been murdered by police officers, but what they don't often mention is that these are people with multiple marginalized identities. Um, and those marginalized identities all together are what led to their untimely murders. Their lives mattered, their black lives mattered, their disabled black lives mattered, and that's important for us to be able to state in this space. Today I want to propose to you all something that some people might call lofty, others might call revolutionary, others might say it's impossible. But before I begin, I want to remind you that those same words were used um, with advocates um, like the, the Honorable Senator Harkin um, as related to the ADA 25, 30 years ago when it was conceived of. Um, so I want you all to dream with me for a while. Um, let's explore what's possible and not worry about what exists now. Um, let's think outside of the box, outside of the realm. So that's what I'm challenging us to do today. So stay with me. So here's what I propose. I'm proposing an end to police brutality and mass incarceration by engaging in intersectional disability justice advocacy that, because of its historic and present work related to deinstitutionalization and creative community-based solutions is already steeped in creative, um, creative and innovative transformative deinstitutionalization policies and practices. And at its core, that is what mass incarceration is. It is institutionalization. And it's important to name that as well. So here are the statistics and information that provide a framework for my proposal. Um, I'm just going to run down some brief statistics that are available online. Um, children with disabilities are three times more likely to be placed in foster care um, than those without disabilities. Children with disabilities are four times more likely to be living in poverty than those without disabilities. 65% of boys and 75% of girls in juvenile detention have mental illnesses. Children with disabilities are 50% more likely to drop out of school than those without disabilities. Black children represent 18% of the preschool enrollment population but 48% of those preschoolers, preschoolers, yes, who are receiving more than one out-of-school suspension. Now, the larger question, of course, is why are we suspending preschoolers? But the second is, OK, let's talk about racial disparity and disability disparity in those, in those numbers. Children with disabilities enter the juvenile system at five to six times the rate of youth who do not have disabilities. Up to 85% of children in juvenile detention have at least one disability. And of that 85%, only 30-some-odd percent of them are receiving access to services in their schools pursuant to IDEA, which Dara mentioned earlier. 60% um, unemployment rate, which was mentioned by the honorable um, retired senator. And um, disproportionately underemployed or not employed within the deaf and disabled communities. 
So those are the kind of key statistics that should paint the, the, the broad strokes. And these last three are super critical, so stay with me. The largest mental health providers in the nation are jails. Cook County in, in Chicago, Rikers Island in New York, and LA County jails. Blacks and Latinos make up 30% of the US population, but 60% of the incarcerated population. And now 20% of our population here in the United States, of course, has disabilities. We represent 20% of the population that is in the United States. We represent, studies have shown, 60 to 80% of those who are incarcerated in jails and prisons across the nation. So at the end of the day, what that means is people with disabilities are the largest minority population in jails and prisons, period. If ever there was a crisis of institutionalization of people with disabilities, that crisis is now. It's impossible to address the issues of mass incarceration without addressing it with a disability and deaf justice lens. While many have begun the, the important discussions surrounding uh, the harms visited upon so many communities of color um, and different communities, religious affiliations and so on and so forth, our native nations, um, there's been you know, a very a vast chasm of, of discussion about disability. And Dara is absolutely right. Those discussions that do center on disability and criminal justice tend to focus on very specific portion of people with disabilities to the detriment of other disability communities, which is highly problematic. Um, for example, um, I'm going to skip some stuff because I can come back to it later. Um, for example, people who are deaf, diabetic, epileptic, you mentioned these things, uh, have actually been murdered by police officers. Um, these people don't have intellectual disabilities, um, don't have uh, mental health conditions, are not experiencing crises, but have physical conditions that um, render them, because the police officers are not um, utilizing the ADA, um, mitigating or um, taking time to stop before they resort to lethal violence against our community members um, literally are being murdered because they have a disability. Um, so we have to state that in this space. Um, and our jails and prisons are literally overflowing with people with disabilities um, out in California and many other states. We've had judges actually ruling that we need to de-incarcerate specific prisons because they are literally overflowing with folks. Um, so that's kind of the large lay of the land. And despite this long-standing federal disability rights laws that we all know of and love and cherish, the ADA, the Rehabilitation Act, which so many people before us spent so much of their lives invested, their hearts invested in creating these laws. What we have to acknowledge is that laws alone um, do not create, we cannot legislate social, cultural, and organizational and agency change. We have to take further action. Um, and that's kind of where we are today. Um, And I'll give you some for instances, right? So for instance, although it's rarely discussed, deaf people and people with disabilities are often wrongfully convicted because of lack of access to police officers, attorneys, and the courts. Then once they're institutionalized, they're physically and sexually assaulted and subjected to depressing isolation and other forms of exploitation. I've worked for a decade on more than 15 deaf wrongful conviction cases. The majority of these cases have uncanny similarities in at least two respects. There are many others, but I'll name two. Department, police departments fail to provide um, reasonable accommodations in terms of communication. Detectives, attorneys, and judges alike, um, the entire system is guilty. Let's be clear, we're not blaming police, we're not blaming judges. The entire system is ableist and audist, and we need to name that in this space. Ableism is discrimination based on your ability. Autism is discrimination based on your ability to speak or hear um, as opposed to sign and listen with your eyes or listen with your hands if you're a tactile um, sign language user. Um, we can't prioritize certain kinds of abilities over other abilities. That's really important also to name. Um, similarly, deaf, deaf blind, deaf disabled, and hard of hearing prisoners customarily experience uh, discrimination and, and terrible abuse in our prisons. Um, punished for failure to obey commands that they can't hear, using sign language to communicate, for failure to follow rules that were never conveyed, for missing counts that they were never aware of, for filing grievances about these persistent inequities, 
Um, they're denied interpreter services, deprived of access to medical and mental health care services in the prisons, denied access to education and reentry programs, cut off from access to the most basic human interaction, all of this coupled with in inaccessible telephone systems in the prison, which I'll get to momentarily. Um, I recently submitted um, testimony to the Senate. They had a, their second ever hearing on solitary confinement. I shared with the Senate and the world, hopefully folks are actually reading our testimony, um, that the, solitary, the use of solitary confinement against people who are deaf and people with physical disabilities is, let's, let's be clear, solitary confinement is torture for anyone, period. Um, it should not be used against anyone um, in any elongated way, and I would argue that it shouldn't be used at all, but that's a whole other revolutionary idea that's not the point of discussion today. Um, but what we do know is that we have deaf people who within weeks, sometimes hours and often in months, um, literally try to kill themselves as a result of the deprivation that happens um, while they are experiencing solitary confinement at the hands of our government. That is in our name. We are responsible for that. Um, there's a, a large discussion um, about solitary and people with mental health. Where is the discussion about solitary and people with other disabilities? And our children, we, um, the ACLU did a wonderful job recently bringing, shedding light on the issue of putting our babies in boxes in solitary confinement and what that does to them mentally and otherwise. Um, but there's not a discussion about physical disabilities in solitary confinement. We should be fighting for all of us at once, not one thing at a time, not only mental health, but not deaf. There's no reason a deaf person or any person with any other disability, which is the vast majority of our prison population, should be in solitary confinement. And that's what we need to be saying as advocates, not let's not put people with mental illness in, prison, in, in solitary. Um, so I'm going to hold on that because I've got more I want to share. Sorry. Um, <laughs> How much time do I have? About three minutes? Two. OK. Um, I'll make it shorter. Finally, despite the existence of these wonderful laws, which we all support and uphold, um, we'll soon, we, my organization, all volunteer nonprofit organization, will soon be in our fourth year of advocacy just to get telephones for people who have communication disabilities in prisons across the nation. As of last month, eight prisons across this nation had video phones. Eight. That means for decades, countless deaf people, deaf, deaf, blind, deaf, disabled, hard of hearing, have had no access to their loved ones, their babies, their families, their attorneys. And we know that people who are deaf actually experience the least access to the justice system in the first instance. So why don't we make sure that they can at least communicate effectively once they're in the jails or prisons across the nation? Um, this is the kind of advocacy that we need to see from folks. Um, so right now we've got criminal justice reform and prison ad advocates who are really finding ways to drastically decrease mass incarceration. Um, they're proposing things like uh, capping sentences, uh, legalizing certain drugs, uh, et cetera, et cetera, alternative courts. Um, what I'm proposing um, is that this, this situation of mass incarceration has, has grown way too large and that, that those things are not going to work. We will still end up, even if we were to release all of those people in these proposals, with mass incarceration levels above what we had in the 1980s. Um, so what I would like us to do is to think about a justice system. Uh, what would it look like if we applied disability justice pr principles, right? And so here's my alliteration for the day, and this is what you should take home with you. Um, our justice system could decriminalize disability, de-escalate law enforcement situations for people in crisis, divert all people with disabilities away from jails and prisons, demand disaggregated data collection on disability in jails and prisons, deinstitutionalize those of us who are presently trapped in the clutch of the system because society has failed for so many decades to provide meaningful support and accommodations for people with disabilities in the first place. Um, many people who are presently incarcerated um, are incarcerated now for behaviors that 40 years ago would have landed them in a psychiatric facility. That's important to state. We have to start re-envisioning and re-imagining criminal justice. Uh, criminal, what is criminal, right? Because criminality is a social construct. And what is justice? And what could that look like if we actually applied a racial justice, a trans justice, a disability justice lens? Um, I think that that is the way that we can advance the rights of all of us, and we really need to recommit ourselves to the long and bitter struggle for justice, as the Honorable Senator mentioned before. 